Hey, Dr. C here with you. Let's take a deep dive into halides. <laughs> Funny thing I don't say very often. No, I've had a lot of questions about people asking, hey, should I test my halide levels? Are these things that are causing thyroid disease? Do they displace iodine? Do they create inflammation? And the main halides are fluoride and chlorine and bromide. So we'll talk through each of those, their relevance. The short answer is there are some ways in which they can be a factor, but in most cases, they're not things you have to test for or think about too much. So let's dive into this. Uh, first up is fluoride. And fluoride is, the halides in general, I should say, these are all elements that are on the same column of the periodic table as iodine is. And so the thought is because they share some properties, they could offset it or have some unique effects upon the thyroid or get trapped by the, thi the thyroid's iodine pump. So fluoride, we get a lot of this from different sources. You know, foods have that. Actually, pickles are rather high. Well, not high, but half a milligram. Spinach has about a third of a milligram. You'll find some in some other foods too in lower amounts. There's a fair amount in tea, believe it or not. But that's a little misleading because we don't consume that much quantity of tea. You know, if we ate tea like a leaf, like a salad in 100 gram quantities or more, it would be relevant. But the amount of tea we're ingesting when we make tea there's not really a significant net dosage. Now, the truth is that fluoride can cause hypothyroidism at high doses. You know, no debates about that. And it does actually displace iodine. This one is known to do that. And in the past, before we had medications to treat overactive thyroid, high dose fluoride was used for those purposes. Now, that threshold seems to be at the lowest about five milligrams per day. So if you're ingesting five or more milligrams per day, it may be a factor. And a lot of the thyroid blocking effects start to show up at well above that, like 10 or 20 milligrams per day or greater. But five is considered to be a pretty safe threshold that even, even bearing in individual variation doesn't have thyroid effects upon humans, adult humans. So it's been looked at in terms of whether dietary fluoride can be a factor for thyroid function, and it pretty clearly cannot. So I have seen some lists about avoiding high fluoride foods like some of the ones that I mentioned, and somehow or other the net effect of them doesn't seem to really be a factor. The highest one I mentioned was pickles at half of a milligram. So in theory, 10 servings of pickles could get you at five milligrams, but all the other foods, they really dropped off and they get down to a range to where it would take, you know, 50 or more servings of just a few of these unusual foods to get a relevant amount. And whole foods always work differently than they do when they're in isolation, when the fluoride is in isolation. So then the question is, well, what about water? What about fluoridated water? And a couple of places have been looked at. Uh, Canada and the UK have had pretty thorough analysis. The UK has found possible links in areas that exceeded 0.3 milligrams of fluoride. That's a little debatable as to whether or not it had effects. It may have changed TSH slightly. It didn't really change rates of thyroid disease. It didn't change active thyroid hormones. Canada did a pretty thorough study as well. They found that typical levels of fluoridation, which are about 0.1 milligram per mil per liter, did not have any measurable effects upon thyroid function. And what's even more compelling, there are some areas that have what's called endemic fluorosis, and that's where they're fluoride toxic. You know, there's really high levels, not fortified, but naturally occurring in the waters. Uh, this is true in some parts of India and China. The geology of the region has just very high amounts of fluoride in drinking water. And fluorosis manifests with abnormalities of tooth coloration, tooth health, and tooth development. So those areas have been studied where there's out and out fluorosis, and they've said, in these cases, does it change overall risk for thyroid disease? And it's been not shown to do that. So even amongst people and populations that clearly have too much fluoride for other reasons, there's not an effect on thyroid function. So altogether, I don't find strong evidence that fluoridated water would affect your thyroid. However, I'm not a fan of tap water for other reasons. You know, you want purified water. And as such, it will have fluoride removed even if you do have the fluor water fluoridated in your municipality. So probably doesn't affect you from fluoridated water, but purified water is still better anyway. And there's also been a question as to whether or not fluoridated water may cause cancer. I had a classmate who talked about fluoridated water being a factor for stomach cancers. And the data on that is suggestive that it's not, not relevant that way. But again, purified water. 
The other question comes up about toothpaste. So if toothpaste can affect your thyroid function. Well, the, the amount of fluoride in over-the-counter toothpaste is about 1,000 to 1,500 parts per million. So if you're using about a gram dose of toothpaste, and if you ate it, you'll get about one to one and a half milligrams of fluoride. So if you're eating your toothpaste and you're doing about five, five to 10 servings per day, well, I guess five, five to four servings a day or more, you could start getting too much fluoride. If you're not eating it, you wouldn't assimilate significant amounts. Most of it does work topically, but not much does absorb. The amount that comes in your body from dental treatments is pretty minimal, and that, that has been studied. I looked at papers about that to where people from toothpaste or people receiving dental treatments had their fluoride levels monitored, and yet only the tiniest amounts, if any, gets into your system. And this is also true for dental fluoride treatments, where you wear a tray and they do high amounts of that. There's not significant amounts that come into your body. So if you eat the stuff, it's different, but if you don't eat it, and it's not a regular thing. And that's a factor, the areas that where high levels may be questionable, that's like daily exposure for decades. So don't make toothpaste a big part of your diet, <laughs> and you'll do okay that way for those things. And at the same time, there's non-fluoridated toothpaste that are readily available, if that's still a concern. So action steps for fluoride. Uh, there are fluoride supplements. There are supplements that have fluoride, and there are those that are supplements of fluoride. And using those in higher amounts, <clears throat> one definitely could get too much fluoride, and that could be a factor slowing thyroid function. If you are in one of the areas that has endemic fluorosis, that's not good for other reasons. If you've got fluoridated water, you're better off with purified water anyway. And yeah, toothpaste, don't make it a big part of food. <laughs> uh, chlorine, that's the next halide to talk about. So chlorine, well, what do we know about that? There's been theories about it also being an issue because it is a halide and about it possibly building up inside the body and displacing iodine. <clears throat> and the halides in general, I looked at the possibility of them being concentrated by the thyroid, and that's shown to not be the case. So the pump that the thyroid uses to pull in iodine, that pump doesn't really glom onto the other halides. It just doesn't concentrate them. So when they circulate in the body, they do circulate, but they're not higher in the thyroid than they are anywhere else. And what's unique about iodine in the thyroid is that the amounts that are useful are far, far greater than the amounts the bloodstream carries. So iodine only gets to do anything in the thyroid after the thyroid concentrates at like 50 or 100 fold higher. But the concentrator does not work on chlorine or bromide. They're just not built up there. <clears throat> and chlorine specifically, it's been known clearly to be an irritant. So skin, uh, eyes, it can be an irritant and cause some inflammatory symptoms. This is especially true for pool level chlorine and especially true for indoor pool level chlorine because there's nowhere for it to off gas as well. In those cases, a lot of it is off gassing into the air and you're breathing quite a bit of it and it may affect your eyes more strongly. Uh, it's been looked at as to whether we see chlorinated water affect thyroid disease in infants. You know, there were studies at first thought to see that subclinical hypothyroidism was more common in preterm infants given chlorinated water, but that did not pan out on closer analysis. And there was even an interventional trial done in which humans were given rather high concentrations of chlorinated water at 20 parts per million, you know, much more than typical. And there was no measurable change in thyroid function from that. We've also got animal studies looking at this very same thing to see if highly chlorinated water changed thyroid function or changed iodine uptake. This was done in rats and monkeys and shown not to be the case. So chlorine, uh, no clear effects upon your thyroid. Again, purified water is best. And pool water, it may be an irritant for your skin. It can burn your eyes. And there is data saying that long-term exposure to indoor pools can be a risk for asthma and respiratory symptoms. So totally true but not a big factor as far as any speck of it being harmful to your thyroid, even from pool exposure. And that's, that's something to where <clears throat> it may be harder to work around. If you've got a pool that's a source of exercise for you, you're getting some enjoyment from, you're probably better off doing that and having the benefits of exercise than you are avoiding that in terms of any fears about that affecting your thyroid. It could irritate your lungs if it's indoors, but if you're not prone to lung issues and you're not getting skin symptoms and you're using goggles to protect your eyes, probably not as relevant that way either. So next up we got bromine. 
And this is one that's received a lot of a lot of visibility and a lot of, I don't know, intense, intense emotional discussions. <clears throat> there's a there's a group of doctors putting out information on iodine, and they've talked in their work about bromine being a big part of thyroid disease. They've claimed that uh, megadose iodine can be helpful because it pushes out stored bromine, and also that many of the seemingly side effects from iodine are really side effects from bromide detoxification. Um, and these are things that just don't fit with what we know about how bromine is metabolized. Iodine doesn't displace it. It's not concentrated by the thyroid. It's pretty even throughout the body. There's some really strong quotes saying things like, all foods that contain bromine need to be avoided. And also, there have been claims made like animal studies have shown that ingestion of bromine can cause hypothyroidism. And there was, there was one study, and in that study, the, there were iodine deficient rats, and their diet was basically four to 16,000 milligrams of bromine per kilogram per day for four weeks. And in those cases, there were subtle changes on thyroid function. They were iodine deficient. So the rates of thyroid disease in that study were not greater than they would have expected to have been just from the overt iodine deficiency by itself. So they did show thyroid disease in this population, but the researchers themselves concluded that it wasn't clear that the really high doses of bromide, literally tens of thousands times more than humans get, they couldn't say if that caused the thyroid disease or if it was just the normal thyroid disease from overt iodine deficiency that was a culprit. It wasn't worse than would have been expected. There's also been claims uh, that bromine toxicity can be present even with low amounts of bromine in the diet. And I saw a reference for that, but the reference when I followed it, the researchers actually said that all the findings were within normal limits. Bromine had no measurable effects in any doses in that study. And I talked about that one in, in other papers I've written. So it, it makes me concerned when we call things good or bad. You know, there's many substances we're exposed to that are not helpful at any dose, but to avoid them completely. You know, we can't avoid all foods with bromine. You know, bromide's a big part of the soils. It comes from the oceans. And many of foods, many foods are dense in that. You know, shellfish, many types of seafood have substantial amounts, a couple milligrams per serving. So what happens to humans? So what happens, actually happens to humans with their thyroid function when they're given high doses of bromine? Well, that's been done. That's been tested. And one study looked at healthy people and compared their thyroid function to, to bromine levels. They saw really no tie between any levels of bromine and thyroid function. Uh, another one showed that they actually gave people rather high doses of bromine and then monitored thyroid function. And this one was surprising. It was even a blinded human trial. So they, they gave bromide to males and non-pregnant females for 12 weeks, uh, three doses per day, and the doses were between zero, the placebo, four or nine milligrams. Normally in the course of the whole day from your food and your diet, you get about two milligrams. So what that means is that people were getting, you know, 30, up to 30 milligrams per day, up to 15 times more than normal for quite a while. Uh, and in the active group, the doses ended up netting about 300 times what a typical daily intake would have been. So 300 fold your normal levels. And all said and done, there were no changes for any markers of thyroid function. T4, thyroid binding globulin. They also looked at cortisol, estradiol, progesterone, testosterone, TSH, prolactin, LH, FSH, a lot of general blood chemistry and urinalysis, and nothing showed up. What they did notice is that some of the women on the highest amounts of bromine had higher levels of both T3 and T4 uh, at the end of the study compared to the beginning. So not out of range, but a little higher than they were beforehand but no negative effects. If anything, maybe a small positive effect if it was even meaningful. So I have no doubt there is a point in which we can get too much, but that's far, far away from what we're gonna get from food or common sources. And here's a funny thing too, there's another quote that I found, someone saying, there is no known therapeutic value for bromine, therefore any level of bromine can easily cause problems. This is a quote from someone arguing against bromine. Well, now, <laughs> in the recent past, as of 2014, bromine has been categorized as the 26th known essential element. I didn't know that until working on this. So it turns out that bromine is essential for collagen formation, specifically type 4 collagen and sulfamine. 
They depend upon bromine for working well. These are things that are used in every part of the body. You know, these are used in the kidney membranes, the blood vessel linings, the gastrointestinal linings, also in nerve tissue. And there's even an autoimmune disease called good pasture syndrome that can be caused by a lack of bromine. We now know it's essential. <laughs> we never really saw this as a recognized condition in the past just because bromine is so commonly available in a lot of foods. But we've seen this by looking at people who are on only intravenous nutrition because they've got no gastrointestinal function or from people who are on dialysis because they might lose more bromine. So you actually need some. It's not a bad thing. You need to ban from your body. You need to have some of it. They've also shown that part of the problem, some of the health risks from smokers can come from the thiocyanate they ingest and how that can eliminate, eliminate bromine from the body. So whenever we do get extra bromine, your kidneys can dump that out and they can do so pretty effectively. So all together with bromine, are there plausible risks for people? Um, no, there's really not. The amount that we get from our diet, from foods, good foods, bad foods, from the environment, have no measurable effect upon health parameters. It seems that we need some. Even those taking whopping amounts didn't have negative changes for thyroid function. So here's a quick summary on the halides. Uh, chlorine, chlorine can be a lung irritant. It doesn't displace iodine. It doesn't concentrate in the thyroid. Uh, it's on oral doses. The data is mixed whether that raises the risk of any cancers, but oral should be avoided. You know, have purified water. If you enjoy time in a pool, I wouldn't worry about that apart from respiratory or skin irritation. Bromine, you don't need to test or detox bromine. And the harmful effects of iodine are not from bromine detox. They're just from the harmful effects of iodine. So we now know bromine is actually an essential nutrient. The amount that we get in foods is not toxic. It's not harmful. It may even be harmful to get too little, which some people with health challenges do. Now, of all the, the halides, fluoride is the only one clearly documented to disrupt thyroid function. And that can be a problem when we're exceeding about five milligrams per day. Do be mindful of supplementation. Do avoid supplements that contain fluoride that would net amounts greater than that. As far as in the water supply, it doesn't seem to affect the thyroid in any way, but I do recommend purified water regardless. As far as dental sources of fluoride, apart from ingesting dental treatments or toothpaste, like eating it, doesn't seem to be a factor either. So there's everything about the halides. <laughs> a few more things not to worry about, a couple things to think about, but hopefully that was useful for you. And take great care. Bye-bye.